What's up, guys? This is Mike Cashew, and I'm back on the Brute Strength Podcast. This episode, I interview Stan Pastouche and Jeremy Todd of Active Life RX. Our discussion today is based on one central problem, and that is that athletes and uh, exercise enthusiasts in general spend an enormous amount of time and energy uh, working on mobility, flexibility, and injury prevention. And a lot of times, we're simply just putting a band-aid over the issue. And so th- these guys practice uh, and, the, and this discussion revolves around how to create a system that produces long-term results um, using uh, structural balancing as well as your traditional uh, mobility exercises and such. Um, it's, it's a very, it's almost like a, a paradigm shift of the way we look at mobility and injury prevention. Um, as always, you can find the show notes at brutestrengthtraining.com forward slash podcast. Hope you enjoy the show. All right, what's up, guys? Uh, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, pleasure to be here. It was, uh, I think you guys were the third podcast we ever did. Yeah, it was over a year ago or about a year ago. Yes, crazy to see how far you guys have come, as have we. Yeah, crazy to see how all of us have, how far all of us have come. Exactly. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, um, Active Life, Sean and Jeremy are uh, connected with Brute. They are the movement specialist, rehab specialist. Uh, you'll see them at the Brute Retreat this year if you come to that. Um, and they also have... Active Life RX, which we're going to talk in detail about today. So, really excited to dive into some new questions after you have both dealt with thousands of new athletes. So, my first question is: What are what is the biggest thing, or what what, what has changed since the last time uh, that we talked um, after having worked with so many athletes? So, I think the biggest thing that's changed is we went from you know, thinking that we had a pretty good system and having to test it and try it to, you know, being unconditionally confident that our system works because it's worked thousands of times for thousands of people. It's it's a totally different confidence when you've had the experience of success working with people versus when you're just confident in yourself that what you're what you're putting out there is going to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what are the, the, uh, the yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, and I think um, our, just our, our our depth and understanding and our our evolution um, with this, you know, it's right, we should always always be evolving and having an, another year and thousands of people to work with. You know, you start to flesh out some of these these minor what you thought were minor details, but turn out to be these these major concepts and these mm-hmm. these major faults that we're seeing with people that are you know relatively easily remedied once you're looking at it through the right the right prism. Right. So I want to I want to talk about the elite athletes as well as the average Joes, because I know at first you were working with a lot of uh, elite athletes um, and now you're working with a lot of different kinds of people. But first off, on the elite side, so you're working with some of the very top people. Name name a couple of those people. Okay, um, we've been fortunate to obviously the athletes who work with with you and with Brute. So uh, Brooke Entz has been working with us. Um, we got the opportunity to work with Gretchen Kittleberger, Jared Stevens, uh, Brooke Wells is an athlete who we work with very closely. Uh, we work with Samantha Briggs, Nicole Holcomb. Uh, we were working with Cole Sager, Noah Olson, Christine Andali, who we think is going to make a nice big splash in California this year. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving off. People and they're going well, to be mad at so me. So a bunch of heavy hitters, a bunch so of heavy hitters, very yeah, that, heavy yeah. hitters. And let, let's not leave out the masters heavy heavy hitters like. Right, that's true. Our boy Jeff Prejean and the Lisa Jeff Love, Prejean. The, <laughs> the Jeff Prejean. <laughs> yeah, April Love is out there. Amy Mandelbaum. So yeah, some, right. some awesome. very good so, athletes. This, I mean, this is a, an entirely different kind of athlete caliber of athlete that even you guys are are. Uh, used to working with that you started to work with over the past year what have you noticed um, that is unique about these guys it's a good question for sure their their needs right i mean it's 
when you take someone who's just walking into the gym and has back pain, they don't mind when you tell them you're too good at deadlifting and you need to do more squatting uh, in order to even out that balance. When you tell a CrossFit Games athlete or a CrossFit Games hopeful uh, that you think that they need to almost completely omit a portion of their programming in favor of something that would be more beneficial for them, it's a, it's a much harder sell. You know, you better be right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then how do y'all have that conversation? How, how, and how are you selling that to them? Well, it's just uh, explaining how we do things and how we look at it and just showing them the data. Um, it's, you know, when we say, listen, you are 50% better at, you know, downward rotating your scapula versus upwardly rotating it. And that's really the root of your, your shoulder issues. They're like, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, okay. I should be able to do that. And I'm not even close. Okay. Yeah, let, let's let's shift what I'm doing to to work on that. And it's always helpful when they've you know when they've had chronic pain, um, because when you've had chronic pain, you've been doing things kind of chronically wrong. Um, that that needs to be addressed. Um, and and really that's it. And then once you do that, and and they start to feel it, in you know in a week or two, that's that's when you really get the ball rolling. And then it's like, mm-hmm. now you have their attention and, and now you can really start to make a, a big impact on what they're doing. I think, I think there's also something to be said for an athlete finding that they physically cannot perform something at any given time. Like we, we've worked with, not to, not to talk about who it was, but you know, one of the athletes on that list couldn't step up on a box, physically couldn't step up on a box without debilitating pain when we first started. So you know, when they're coming to you with that, significant of a problem they're they're open to your suggestion because they recognize that if they can't step up on a box they can't go to the crossfit games so they got to do something right so let's let's back up even a little bit more and maybe we should have started here explain um exactly what it is that you're doing with these guys that for those that don't know Uh, explain the uh programming a little bit right so it all starts with an evaluation, right? Because you need to know where someone's at in order to get them where they're going. So we start by evaluating basic movement patterns, ranges of motion, right? Can you, when you stand there and try and touch your toes, do you get down there? What does it feel like? Put your arms up over your head. How far does it get? What does it feel like? All right, so basically, are, you, are your joints able to go through the appropriate and relevant ranges of motion to do the things that you need to do? Um, from there, we go into our strength testing, right? Where we're, we're comparing your ability to create force in different functional movement patterns. So how are you squatting? You know, what, what's, what's your ability to squat and how much can you squat before you become stressed versus deadlifting versus your one arm farmer carry versus your pull-ups and dips and stepping up on a box. And from there, we create a really, you know, well-defined strength parameter as to what somebody is really good at and what somebody's not so good at, right? And then what we're going to do is then prioritize, okay, you're missing ranges of motion here, right? You're missing strength in these functional movements. Well, that's what we need to, that's what we need to work on. We need to come up with programming that's going to give you more range of motion and strength at your end range of motion. We need to shift your programming from the things that you're already good at because you've been you've spent years getting good at them. It's not going to go away, right? And we need to shift more towards loading you in other ways in order to make your joints feel better as well as allowing you to perform better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times we have people not doing movements, working on other things, and then they come back around. So that we have a woman who hasn't done a pull-up in four months – her previous PR was two. Now she's doing eight pull-ups after not doing pull-ups in four months. Wow. You know, things like that. And to, to add to that a little bit, it's, it's even – because people will hear that and think like, oh, well, I know I'm not a good squatter, so I'll just squat more. It's, it's, it's more specific than that. Mm-hmm. We're looking at – you know, everyone knows their one rep max. But if I go around gym to gym and ask people, you know, well – how many reps can you do with your left leg on a step up with half of that weight? They're like, well, I have no idea. Well, how about your right leg? Well, I have no idea. Well, don't you think it's important to know if you're producing 60 or 70% of the force with one leg versus the other? You know, and they're like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess that is important. And you know, then, then the same question for the shoulders, you know, how much do you press with your left? How much do you press with your right for how many reps? 
and it becomes a question of, you know, uh, man, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that I couldn't do that. So now what do I do about it? And then we start breaking it down for one rep, 12 rep, 20 reps, all those, all those different ranges to find where that person's most likely to break down so that we can fix that before it rears its head. Mm -hmm. Let me ask y'all something. You, you mentioned strengthening the body at, it, um, at, at its end range and something since the last time we did a podcast called functional range conditioning has blown up. And it sounds to me like that piece that you're talking about. Can you talk about, you know, strengthening at end range and, and just define that and, and talk about how you go about that? Right. So, so when you look at, um, any joint, uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll look at the shoulder. I think it's relatively easy to think about, right? Um, that shoulder, you know, has a, a very large range of motion, right? You need to be strong throughout that range of motion, right? If you even think about going shoulder to overhead, right? Your, your elbows need to go from, you know, below your shoulder to completely above your shoulder and you better be strong the entire way through. What we find is that people get very strong <laughs> through mid ranges, right? But they're not so strong at end range. And we'll see this in people that are able to, you know, their hips are able to throw up a weight if they're jerking, right? They're able to throw the weight up over their head. Their arms are able to get there because they have the mobility, but they don't have that strength in that position in order to, to catch that weight. And so you'll see them buckle um, or you'll see them miss it, right? And that's how people will end up, you know, hurting themselves. Um, because I think what's, what's also lost is that people need joints. Uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, but your, your, your muscle, it's not just your muscle working. You need to be strong at angles and that's how your joints and your motor patterns work is you need, your joint needs to be strong at all sorts of different angles and through that full range of motion. A, a good real life example of that. And I know he wouldn't mind me talking about it is Jared Stevens. And he's actually a little bit different than what Jeremy just mentioned, but he's a guy who can power snatch 280 pounds, right? So 280 pounds off the floor to overhead, no problem. But it's painful when he does it, or it was painful when he did it, and, and he was struggling to hit it consistently. And when we had him test his high pull, he struggled to pull a 45-pound kettlebell with a single arm. So he doesn't have the strength through the full range of motion. He's just so strong through his hips and so strong at the top that he's able to compensate and totally avoid that mid-range. Um, but he couldn't squat snatch that weight so comfortably because the mobility restriction was there a little bit and the end range becomes a different location. So that's kind of the angles that Jeremy's talking about needing to be strong in. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah. No, go ahead. If you have any, no, I was, I was just, I was just confirming yeah. with them. <laughs> oh, what, what, so what are the most common problems that you've seen over the last year with the general population? And then how, how are you going about fixing those problems? So our general population uh, would be the CrossFit population. So what we see is definite deficient, deficiency in pulling the scapula up. Um, we see definite uh, unilateral strength imbalance, especially um, in deep hip flexion. So that's why we end up using high box squats so often. So not only are they weak on one leg, right? They're weak in deep hip flexion. We'll see that the lunge is relatively well maintained. We won't, but then you put them up on a box where that they're 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 in a little bit more of a deeper hip flexion. They can't get up out of it. You're talking about box step-ups. Yes, box step-ups. Yeah. Got it. Weighted. Um, uh, and from there... That's, that's, and that one's new to me. I, I, I want to stop you before I forget. What, why is that, the deep hip flexion part? Well, if you think about the, the general population, right? we're not going to talk about elite athletes right now, but okay. people walking around, right? this kind of leads into sitting as the new smoking. right? Everybody's sitting in about 90 degrees of hip flexion. Right and and people don't get down deeper in order in order to generate force up out of it. So we'll see that the hip is relatively strong from that ninety degrees and above. So think about sitting in a chair and standing up, which will be relatively similar to the the bottom of a lunge, just in a unilateral stance. Mm -hmm. But people aren't getting all the way down, right? People aren't hanging out in a squat and standing up all the time. So when they walk in the gym, the ranges that they've been using are strong and preserved. 90 and above is strong and preserved. You ask them to go lower, right? They haven't been living there. Their muscles haven't been generating force at that angle, right? And that's, they're going to be very weak. And typically that's one of the things that you'll see a butt wink 
is a cause of that, right? That it can be a mobility thing, the butt wink, but a lot of the times we'll find, okay, you're passing all your mobility tests, you're just not strong down there. Let's get you strong in that angle and you're going to start functioning a lot better. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and then from there, uh, carrying. Um, you know, we get good at the things we practice. And what do we practice every, every week in, in CrossFit gyms, right? We're squatting a bunch. We're pulling things off the floor a bunch. We're pulling things a lot. You know, we're probably pressing a lot. But we don't see a lot of carrying, um, people carrying things around. So we see that lagging behind in CrossFitters, which ironically when we test people who don't do CrossFit, carrying is a little bit more in ratio with people. Right, their squat isn't as well developed, but they're it's more in ratio, and it's it's less of an issue with people walking around. And so, what? Why is this important? Why is carrying important to overall health and fitness? Well, there, there's it depends on what kind of carrying we're talking about, but in general, it's it's a sustained load on your system that you're moving from point A to point B. So. When we have you carry a single arm kettlebell, for example, if it, or a single arm farmer's handle, excuse me, if it's in your right hand, you need the whole left side of your body to fire up in order to keep you straight. You need your right shoulder to resist downforce uh, so it doesn't dislocate, right? You need your elbow to do the same thing and your hand to do the same thing. Um, when we have you holding weight overhead, it's a constant compressive load that's taxing your shoulder at, at its end range. Uh, if you're walking with a yoke, it's just a lot of... Uh, axial loading where we're loading up your spine under tension that you don't typically get so when you see that unexpectedly in the gym or when you see that expectedly you're more prepared to account for it more prepared to handle it Mm -hmm. let me ask you this what's the difference and let's just take the farmers farmers carry farmer hold what's the difference between saying doing a single arm a uh, suitcase deadlift where you're you're picking up one deadlift on the right side of your body 10 times, right? Or what's the difference between that and doing a hold on the same side? What's the difference in the stimulus? Well, the difference will be it, when you're doing that suitcase deadlift, right? You're you're actually moving through a range of motion and you're unloading at the bottom to some extent, right? So your your position is constantly changing, the load is changing, so on and so forth. Where now, if, if I ask you to walk with that, you're, you're asking your torso to sustain a posture, and you're also asking to your diaphragm to breathe under a, a constant load, mm-hmm. right, while, while you're walking. Um, so, so for me, it, it, it almost allows you to think about more, think about your posture and, and your breathing under load, which, I mean, for me, that's what a lot of CrossFit is. Can, can you maintain that upright torso when you're doing your 95th? thruster um while you're breathing under load right right what what are the what kinds of holds should people incorporate and how many times per week i think that varies person to person um okay we but we we do a lot of front rack holds just with you know 100 percent, 110 percent of a one rep max front squat for example um the way I like to program those will be typically about 30 seconds on, then a minute and a half off. And as they become better at that weight, we go to 35 seconds on, a minute 25 off, 40 seconds on, a minute 20 off, 45 on, a minute 15 off. And when they can hit that, I'm comfortable increasing the weight um, until I feel like it's no longer a relevant movement to do. Um, we have people hold weight overhead. Uh, our goal for that is we want you to be able to take 110% of your one rep max strict shoulder press. So if you can shoulder press 100 pounds with a barbell, we want you holding 110 pounds over your head. Um, And our test for that is we want you to be able to accumulate two minutes holding over your head in under three minutes of running clock time. Wow. Um, We'll also do a lot of supinated holds. So for example, a supinated grip uh, hang just from a pull-up bar because we spend so much time with our hands in a pronated position, whether it's typing on the computer, pulling a barbell, doing your chest to bars, doing pull-ups. Uh, we think there's a lot of benefit to getting out of pronation and into supination. And a lot of people will come in and not be able to do that at all because of pain. And we'll start those people off with you know supinated grip deadlifts just to acclimate their wrists, their hands, their elbows, and their shoulders a little bit to that range of motion. Mm-hmm. What about 
incorporating ropes. Julian uh, Pino and I were talking about this a couple weeks ago, and he's a huge fan of ropes and um, talks about it like there's just there's no other way to ensure that we're training the entire arm and forearm, right? Do you guys incorporate ropes at all into your program? We like to incorporate ropes when someone has ropes available, but when we use ropes, we're typically focusing more in the horizontal pulling Mm -hmm. angle, right? I mean, would you agree with that as far as what you're going to prescribe? Because what we see in CrossFit is there's a lot of down pulling, right? And big muscles like the lats and the rhomboids, they're going to assist in that, but they're also going to assist in horizontal pulling, which is just an angle that we don't hit. So the shoulder can become deficient in that. So... We actually have a guy right now in the parking lot. I think we just finished pulling a sled um, in a seated position. You know, it, it gets you out of the sagittal plane because the torso is rotating. Um, it gets you pulling in a way that you're not typically pulling. So we like ropes. I don't know if we like him as much as Julian, but uh, we like him. Awesome. We'll find Boy. out. We're gonna see him. We're gonna see him at the games. We already invited him nice. to the house. So. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, he's gonna sleep in your bed. Hell yeah, good. <laughs> um, it, in terms of entire gyms, I know you you guys work with some some gyms in, in an affiliate kind of way. What what do you think gyms in general should do less of? And is it, it are there problems that are uh, in the CrossFit community as a whole, or do you think uh, they're just problems in in specific gyms programming? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there is stuff, uh, as you know, the community at large, I think can be doing better. And I'm sure there's a ton of gyms that are doing it. You know, I'm sure there are a ton of gyms that are, are not doing it also. Um, but I think first thing is getting, getting in some low intensity stuff, um, on a weekly basis. You know, if you have, when you have people that are constantly stressed outside of the gym and they come in and they're pushing themselves at high intensity um, all the time, right, that can lead to crashing more often. Why don't you give so, an example? So an example of that, that that we do here is we'll do performance care piece is what we call it. And it's anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour. of uh, we'll, we'll take about four movements, whether they're gymnastic skills, um, odd objects. Is there, is there music on in the back? There's a vacuum. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. Sean, Sean's going to take care of it. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, so we'll take you know these things that are hard to work in the program, right? It's hard to program in unilateral high pulls. It's it's hard to to you know work in you know sled sled pulls or sled drags. Maybe you know it's it's hard to work in some gymnastics skills in a coherent way. So we'll take you know we'll take for example you know you'll do eight one arm thrusters. Then you're going to do, you know, a 20 second underhand bar hang. Then you're going to, you know, do a farmer carry for 60 meters. And then you're going to do, you know, a sled drag for for another 60 meters. Mm-hmm. Um, but the goal of this is to keep your respiratory rate under five breaths per 20 seconds. So when you're doing this, it's it's slower down, faster up tempo, which is just great for joints um, and tendons. It's not breakneck. This is not four times. This is not four reps. It's for quality, right? And you have to measure your breathing rate after each exercise, and you do not move on to the next one until your breathing rate is at that under that five breaths for per twenty seconds. So that's one thing that we found. Um, also, is, you know, incorporating these things that don't get that used so much. You know, like like carries, like high pulls, like horizontal pulling. Um, as well as getting away from um, so much downward pulling, right? We saw b- beyond the whiteboard, number one prescribed movement or number one log movement last year was pull-ups, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's a lot of downward pulling on your shoulder, and I don't know if people are doing enough upward pulling, and that's what we're seeing is, is giving a lot of shoulder relief, is focusing more on that, that upward pull and upward press of the scapula. So those are some just general things that we see. And to add to that, I think that one of the most important things that gyms can start doing is incorporating assessments when members come in. You know, it's um, it's tough to tell somebody, I don't want you to do that because it's not in your best interest when they just joined your gym because they want to get fit and be like their friends. Um, but we find that often, not always, but often there's, you know, coaches are telling people they need to squat lower. 
right? You need to get your head through at the top. Um, mm-hmm. This is how you kip, whatever it might be, <clears throat> without having any real concrete measurable assessment tool prior to make sure that the athlete can squat lower and should squat lower and mm-hmm. can get their head through at the top and should get their head through at the top and so on and so forth. You know, I worked with a guy this morning who, um, you know, he, he, I said, what do you think your biggest limiting factor in your clean is? He's 155 pounds. He cleans 315 pounds. He's a strong dude. Um, and it's like, I just can't get that ankle mobility. You know what I mean? And I'm like, well, what are you doing for it? You know, rolling out, stretching it, banded stuff. I'm like, okay, why? He's like, I don't know. That's what I've seen. So we assessed him. I'm talking 30 seconds to a minute assessment just to see how much his ankle actually moved in an objective way. And he'll probably never do ankle mobility again. He doesn't need it. When we were done looking at him, his hips don't move. He got to like 98 degrees and his hips were done. So his problem becomes he can't get into the right position for a, a good a good lift, but it had nothing to do with his ankles. And I think right. gym owners can help their athletes by knowing that before their athlete starts wasting 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day working on something that's worthless. Right. And these and, assessments and I definitely are- want to talk more about um, you know, how they can get you guys to help with that. But bef- before we even get there, having giving people an assessment and giving them this information right out of the gate is one of the absolute best things you can do to retain that member long term. You're going to keep her, keep him, him or her healthy. Um, you're going to just add something very valuable, etc. They're gonna they're gonna trust you and stay in your gym longer, which is what you want. Go ahead, Jeremy. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I was just gonna say, and like, it's not like these assessments are incredibly technical or, or hard to learn, right? They're they're pretty. Uh, deductive and, and relatively easy once once you once you've been exposed to them and you know you can you know you, after practice you can you can really assess somebody's lower body in about two minutes you know and have a huge impact on their life right because one thing that that I've seen over and over again people come in you know they're missing ranges of motion they're gung ho right it's, everything's good they get an injury they're out right yeah and so not only are they out and and becoming you know they're less fit. You know, from a from an ownership point of view, you're not getting that you know that that membership. Well, then they come back, right? And now their head is stronger than their body, mm-hmm. right? So they're able to go to those dark places. They're still not functioning well, and they end up hurting themselves even quicker than they did the last time. You know, and and then that person ends up just working themselves out of the gym. Right. So yeah, it's really getting getting at it from day one um, is a really easy way to take care of it. And I, I also think the coach can be helped by realizing that they don't have to know why. Right, they don't have to know why that person failed that test. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the tests that we created for coaches are are meant to be sensitive, but not specific. Right, so okay, your ankle doesn't move enough, or your ankle does move enough. We need to improve ankle strength or ankle mobility. We're gonna here's how we're gonna go about doing it. Here's the system that follows based on what your test showed us. Um, you know, your knee doesn't flex all the way. Here's what we need to do based on what the system shows us, and so on and so forth, so that. The coach doesn't have to think quite as much. They can understand the ramifications of a failed test or, or a past test and how it affects that athlete on a day-to-day without getting into what are the seven muscles that crosses that joint and which ones are on when the toes are curled and which ones are off when the toes are curled. Mm-hmm. Well, and also, and also having a way to, to know when they can impact it and when they can't. Right. Right? Because there's, you know, it, it, we're coaches and manual practitioners, so it's, it's, it's easy for us to say, hey, I, I can help that in the office really quickly. Coaches don't have that, right? That, n- not most coaches, right? They don't have the ability to put their hands on people. But to have a system to say, okay, this is something that we can, you know, program for for a month and revisit versus you need to go find someone. You know, right. the, the best way to take care of this is to get some good professional hands on you and having somebody that they can refer to. Right. That, that gives the coaches... Uh, a ton of confidence as well as freedom, right? And that, and then they're also going to build better relationships with their athletes Absolutely. and keep people healthy. Yep. And it's one less thing for them to worry about, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, I want to go back to something you said, Jeremy, um, something that I'm just fascinated with and want to learn more about. You were talking about 
tempo work. And I know that a lot of your programming is based on tempo work. So for those of you who don't know, the concentric phase of a squat is the standing up part. The eccentric phase is the going down part. And the part in between at the bottom is isometric. So can you talk about tempo work? And you, and what you said was this is good for tendons and ligaments. Uh, and, and so what is, you know, what is tempo work and why is it effective and what is it effective on? Well, so part of the system is, is like our, our system is just trying to find best practices. Um, and one of the parts of that we found is when in order to keep yourself safe lifting, um, any lift, right? If you can keep a slower down, a slower eccentric and a faster concentric ratio, right? So if it takes me, you know, one second to stand up out of the bottom of a squat, right? I need to lower that back down in 1.1 seconds and then stand back up in one second. Um, it's very, very hard to get hurt, right? Because you're controlling that weight, right? If we see people that fail that tempo from the get-go, the weight's too heavy, <laughs> right? You're, you're not controlling it and your joints are not going to remain in a nice position. Um, when we see that on the 10th or 12th rep, right, they start to fail that tempo. Now they're just fatigued. Same, same idea though, that joint's not going to be in an ideal position. Um, so that's one way uh, that we come back. Cause it's kind of scary, you know, it's kind of prescribing weight for people that have chronic injury and you're asking them to, to lift these things and you want to make sure that they're safe. So that's the, the first reason why we do it. Um, the second thing is that we see a lot of tendinosis in, in, in this population, um, which is essentially just a disorganization of the, the tendon and the, the collagen within the tendon. And what research has shown is that eccentric loading to these tendons is very curative, very palliative, right? That, that slowly lowering down forces those collagen fibers to realign. And as they realign, they become less painful. Right, so it's a way to to get these soft tissues to realign as well as toughen up um, while you're while you're working out, and not just focusing on how much you know how much force can I produce, but also how much force can I can control. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Understood. Right. So it's 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 a two pronged approach. You're doing less you know less um, you know. Uh, reckless damage to your joints because you're controlling it but you're also right. can you know in controlling that weight you're causing the soft tissues to become stronger and more resilient got it and you know what one of the th uh, yeah a couple other things that we love to use tempo work for it gives you time to think about proper technique and form mm -hmm. as well as it's it's basically a completely new type of training and what we know about beginners in anything is they get better really quickly. So if you take someone who's been training for a long time, mm -hmm. but hasn't done tempo training, they're a beginner in this type of training. And they're probably going to make big time gains because it, because they've never done this before, which is really cool. Right. That, that is the other part I left out is the neurologic adaptation that's happening. So not only on the conscious level, right, where you're taking your time to feel these positions, you know, where the, mm -hmm. where the weight is on your feet and so on and so forth. But I think what's often ignored in, in training is that our body is, is, is always learning, right? When we're born, we weren't, we're, not, we're not born with three curves in our spine. We're, we're born with flat feet and a C-shaped -shape, C spine. And we don't know how to wall or walk or crawl or anything. And then as you, you know, I've had the, the luck to watch my child start to walk and move around. And it's, they're learning, right? And what I think speeding through your, your training all the time, you, you don't learn. You don't allow your body and your joints and your proprioceptives to, to learn what a good mm -hmm. position is. And slowing down the movement in that eccentric phase, phase provides that. Right. Cool, cool. So you guys have worked with now thousands of athletes. How... How are you able to work with that many athletes when I know you started this thing with just the two of you? How are you keeping the quality of, the, of this thing high? So we look at it from a good, better, and best situation, right? Um, when we work with an athlete one-on-one, -on -one, uh, there's a lot of social interaction that goes into making sure the program that we wrote for that athlete is, is appropriate. You know, we don't sit down and write a month cycle. We sit down and write our own goals for that athlete within the month or two months, but we write them a week. And then we respond to that week with another week based on how they performed prior. So there's a lot of 
um, is brain intensive. It's time intensive to work with an athlete one on one, and because of that, the, the cost of it reflects it. Um, and that cost became something that a lot of athletes felt that they, they couldn't afford or, or didn't want to afford, but they did want the care and didn't need the help. So we kind of challenged ourselves to come up with a way that we would be able to have athletes get what they needed without having to spend what they didn't have. Um, and looking at systems out there that were working, um, what you guys are doing over at Brute actually was a good model for us with the idea that you're going to test and based on how you perform during your test, um, you're going to be automatically selected for the group program that makes the most sense for what you need. Um, so we wrote various programs for the most common findings that we have, put people through testing where they have the opportunity now to enter those scores into our system, and our system tells them exactly which program they should follow each day. Um, so we called it bulletproof shoulders. We have bulletproof legs now that, that focuses on hips, knees. We have bulletproof ankles to improve ankle movement. Um, and basically, um, what we're doing is providing people with an opportunity for $39 a month, much less time on our end. They can head in there, sign up, and get programming that's progressive for six weeks. Um, and then at the end of those six weeks, receive retesting and new instructions for how they're supposed to proceed now because our programming doesn't replace a coach it accessorizes a coach and educates an athlete um, it's only supposed to take 15 to 25 minutes per day depending on your need mm -hmm. right um, a games athlete maybe a half hour 45 minutes but for the most part we're we're hitting it quick and getting out of it right so that allowed us to now now we're answering questions in a forum setting as opposed to texting with everybody we work with, emailing back and forth, and getting on the phone every day. Um, and we're able to get hundreds of people starting at the same time, um, all getting the same results and supporting each other in the same in the forum, which is huge. Right. And and then with with have have you guys come up with I'm sure you've come across like tons of unique problems working remotely with people like uh, assessments and stuff like that have you come up with any uh unique um fixes or or ways that you handle those issues um yeah the the biggest problem that we run into honestly is that our system as we initially created it um was always meant to be fluid which, which we're fortunate about because it didn't really do a great job accounting for people who are extension intolerant, meaning the person who uh, deadlifts with their back instead of their hips. I think Julian actually touched on last week that a lot of people don't know how to hinge. They're just yanking off the floor with their spine, and that's leading to pain and problems. So our system, uh, as it was previously constituted, didn't really manage much of the motor control and that kind of a, you know, specific problem because most people don't have that. Most people have the opposite. They don't feel good when they reach down to the ground when it comes to their back. So we've had to adapt and work with athletes and see how best to take care of that. What we're finding is that um, rounded back exercises with a, with a stone or, you know, a, uh, a log and time under tension in those positions is proving to be really beneficial for people where previously we might have avoided that because flexion is so often a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, and just equipment availability is, is tough, <laughs> you know, right. but not everybody has, has a stone or a yoke or, or handles. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just kind of coming up with ways around that as well. Mm -hmm. And do you guys, do you guys have like a list of, um, like a substitute, like an exercise substitution library. Yeah, more yeah, or less. People. <laughs> yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very specific to the to the situation. Right. But yeah, like if if you don't have a farmer's handle, well, you know, you better be able to fit two kettlebells in your hand. <laughs> right. yeah, you know, a couple of babies. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly. that's something I, I want to touch on actually for a second is I, I ask people in gyms all the time, you know, are you guys doing carries? Like, yeah, you know, like we'll we'll do a farmer's walk with like ladies take the thirty fives, guys take the fifty threes, and we're not talking about carrying something like your groceries. You know, when, when Jeremy goes for a farmer's walk, I mean, what are you carrying in your hands? Uh, I mean, 
I'll carry I body weight, so I'm doing 200 pounds mm-hmm. for 50 meters. Right. So you know, and I'm 150. That's five. man weight right there. That is well, man when weight. You're a grown man. Nice. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, the idea of you know, I'm 155 pounds, and neither one of us are what we would consider strong for our size in this community. Mm-hmm. And when I'm doing farmers walks, it's with 150, 155 pounds. So it's it's nice that people are out there walking with their kettlebells, but we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Putting some stress on that system and picking something heavy up and going for a walk. Got it. That's yeah. That's a great point. And that's it's not a forearm workout, right? It, not it can no, be. It but, is, but it's not. Right. You know, that's not the main intent. Well, I'm sure. It right. was funny when you start doing heavy carries, or you know, I've seen this time and again where people are like, "Oh, my forearm burns," and then you know, two weeks later, it's like, "Oh, my 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 contralateral oblique burns," and then two people weeks say later. That it's a lot? Like, People well, say they don't say that, but that's, you know, you know what I'm saying. And then it's just like, oh my, you know, that hip, my hip burns, you know. And then two weeks later, it's just like my legs just get tired. So I, like, those, it's funny how the carries, you know, will expose and shore up a lot of those rough edges that people have. Right. And get you forearms like Popeye. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. What's the difference? What, 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 okay, so there are services out there like Ramwad. Ram, Ramwad is the best of, of these that I'm talking about. Services that uh, work on mobility uh, with a large group, right? And, um, you know, it's, it's one, one program for everyone. What, what is the difference and what, is, what are the differences and what are the similarities and, and crossover between you, you guys and a, and a service like Ramwad? I'd say the biggest similarity is we, we both want people to feel better and, and to move more, right? Get, get out of that, as Jeremy likes to call it, you know, phone booth of, of a workout. Um, the biggest difference, I think, between us and Ramwad is, first of all, um, Ramwad, they're, they're a yin yoga situation, right? So you, you can walk in, choose whatever workout you want to do, and do it. It takes you 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 40 minutes, whichever one you choose. Um, it's general. And it's great. It's it's great for improving blood flow. It's great for you know the sympathetic nervous system. It's it's great for a lot of things. Um, what we are is specific for your thing, right? So um, we're specific and we're progressive, and often heavy. You know, we're we're not <laughs> we're not having you do very much yoga at all, right? If we want you to do yoga, we'll tell you to go get a Ramwad subscription, and we do that. We tell people that. Um, but that being said, um, we find that our program needs to be started and gone through in a very specific manner so that it's progressing and building upon itself to provide you with the results that you need to get, much like any program you would go through in your gym. right? You, you wouldn't just come in and squat this this day and a totally different weight the next day and just front squat whenever you want, back squat. There's a plan. So... Our programming reflects that plan. Mm-hmm. I love it. And, and we, we think that, by the way, we, we've worked with Ramwad. We are happy to promote them, and they've been happy to promote us because we think that there's a great synergy there. It's not if you do Ramwad, you can't do us, or if you do us, you can't do Ramwad. You know, it's, it's, there's a happiness there where you might need and want both. Right, as, as most should, I'm sure. What are some of the most challenging cases that you've seen so far? Ooh, I, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> give me, give me your hardest one. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I, it's when it, when there's emotional and social overlay with with the other stuff too. Yeah, dig into that. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we have a. I can give one. Um, so we have an athlete. She'll probably know I'm talking about her. Um, but so games athlete and she noticed that her, you know, and I went through and I looked at her, her results, you know, the opens, the, the regional qualifiers, the games and her, you know, her worst finishes, which would still be better than mine. Right. (laughs) Were with pull-ups or any sort of downward pulling, um, chronic, chronic shoulder pain, like hadn't done a toes to bar pain free in two years. Um, and so she's, you know, she very was like, okay, I, I'm not good at pull-ups relative to my peers, so I need to do them a lot. And so she really 
developed a lot of pulling strength. And when we put her through our test, it was like grotesquely out of balance with everything else that she's done. She's still very strong in every other way. She was just very, very strong in her pull-ups. So having the conversation of, listen, we need you to not do pull-ups mm -hmm. and do these other things instead because constantly working on your pull-ups is making your shoulder pain worse, right? C making your shoulder pain worse is not allowing you to do the things you need to do to train to get to the next level, right? right. So just getting, you know, getting, you know, having that conversation and it was like, ooh, I don't know, <laughs> you know? But she took the leap of faith, you know, and this was before the open, you know, I was like, I don't want you doing pull-ups before the open. It's like heresy, you know, you can't tell me that. Um, but she did it. And now, you know, you fast forward two months later, she's in the master's qualifier. She's doing bigger sets of unbroken muscle ups than she's ever done before. Her bar muscle ups have never been better. And she's putting together more chest to bar uh, pull ups than ever and without pain because she was able to train without pain. We gave her shoulders the strength that they needed to function better. Um, and now she's, now she's here. But early on, that was a very hard case. You know, you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. Um, that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing, period, to tell these kinds of athletes, these super competitive athletes, that you're going to have to maybe even take a step back before you can take the next three steps forward, right? right. Well, and, and I can give you a uh, maybe a more relatable example to people who are not planning to go to the CrossFit Games. Um, is that I, I work with a woman who, again, will probably know I'm talking about her, uh, not a games athlete, not a regionals athlete. Um, I don't even know if she participated in the Open, but um, probably didn't. But she's had back pain for six, seven years, if I'm not mistaken, and she's told me she spent thousands of dollars trying to get it well, um, and to no avail, you know. Um, and it's it was slow in the very beginning. It was, you know, okay, I feel stronger and I'm working out without pain, but that's not really what I started this for. I, I'm still in pain all the time. You know, it's not getting worse when I lift, but it still hurts during the day. So not getting worse when I lift is a win, but still hurting the rest of the day is certainly not. Um, so it took everything from writing her a script to get an MRI to confirm that we were doing everything appropriately to building in much more of that uh, performance care pieces that Jeremy talked about earlier, you know, the, the five rounds for quality, 20 minutes yeah. for quality, uh, that kind of work to bring her stress down. Um, and only recently has she started saying... You know, sorry, we got a motorcycle in the background. Only recently has she started saying, you know, I'm I'm finally starting to dig out of this hole, and I'm startly I'm finally starting to feel good, um, and right. not have pain all day long. So, it's sometimes it takes some persistence, and we have to, you know, we're wrong, and we have to change and get it right, and that's just a part of the process. I mean, honestly, I see what you guys are doing as the future of. Or, or one of the futures of our healthcare system, right? Where people can be very proactive in their health in general, in their in their in the way that they move to prevent these bigger issues. Yeah, I mean, I I tell people all the time: if you're not being assessed by somebody of quality, you're walking around on a clifftop wearing a blindfold, waiting to be pushed off. Exactly. You just you just don't know. You don't know there's something wrong with you because it hasn't hurt yet. But how many times do people go to the gym and they're like, I hurt myself deadlifting? Really? How many hours of sleep did you get last night? Four. Did you drink last night? Yeah, I was out partying with my friends, you know. So you were sitting for hours or you were standing in a bar. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Are you stressed at work? Yes. Um, have you ever twisted your ankle, hurt your back before? Yeah. You didn't hurt yourself deadlifting. You know oh, and I'm doing and I'm doing Smolov. Well, yeah, but <laughs> but Smolov, I love Smolov. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's but we see that all the time. You know, it's like you didn't hurt yourself in your gym. Your gym allowed you to recognize that you were hurt. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, if you sat on the couch eating potato chips with a torn meniscus in your knee, it doesn't bother you. But if you stand up to walk around and your knee hurts, you didn't tear your meniscus walking off the couch. Right. You should never walk again. Right, yeah, you should just stop walking. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. You guys should go back and watch. Listeners, you should go back and watch our, our first episode. It's one of the first five, and uh, it's videoed. And in that one, Sean and Jeremy explain this idea really well where, <clears throat> you know, what we 
what we usually assume is the cause of an injury is really just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and they give you a, vi a visual representation of how to look at different stressors in our life, which is really cool. That's a good memory, Mike. Yep. Uh, what, um, well, one thing to add to what you had said before about the future of, of what's going on is we hope that's the case. And we also understand that we're not the right fit for everybody. You know, like I, I can't help my grandmother with this kind of programming. You know, she's, she's not going to do it, period. It's, it's not in her head to try this. Um, but our thought is that there are enough people who are motivated and who are looking to get into a gym, looking to play a sport, looking to, you know, play with their grandkids, whatever it is, who will do what's necessary to improve. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who we want to be working with. Absolutely. I have a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Uh, my first is kind of a thought experiment. What it? What do you guys want to make absurd in twenty years? And an example of this is, uh, you know, twenty years ago, it was totally common to have a, a store clerk, a grocery store clerk, smoking behind the checkout counter. Right now, that is absurd. Uh, twenty years ago, it was totally normal to throw an entire bag of McDonald's out of the window today. That's absurd in every place except for Louisiana where I grew up. <laughs> um, what do you guys want to make absurd through active life and your life lives in general? That's a great question. That's a very good question. Philosophical Mike dropping a bomb on us. Um, do you have anything you want to make absurd that you can think of? Um, the only thing I can think of is just mindless, high-intensity programming. <laughs> I mean, as much as I know, like uh, you know, this, a lot of CrossFitters are going to hear this. I, I want their, I want it to be people to look back on their programming twenty years ago and be like, "Holy crap! How did I survive that?" Um, I, I want more rhyme and reason to what's going on. You know, I'm not, I'm not against high intensity. I'm not at all, right? I'm not against anything like that. But I want there, I want people to justify what they're doing and when they're doing it and things like that where it's it's just yeah like uh, i can't believe i my body put up with that for that long i have a less deep answer than jeremy and it's it's and it might offend some people i hope it doesn't offend too many people but absurd mobility tools like ab absurd you know just strap yourself to this band until your knee is more mobile i i, I think that you know doing that and like you know i'm not going to bring any of them to the forefront, it's not my, my place or my business, but just that, I, I, I view them as absurd already, so I hope that in the next, <laughs> yeah. everybody else will do it with me. Well, did you hear about the mobility wand? I don't even want to. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about it. It's, okay. it's, I think it's it's twenty nine ninety nine. You the the wand is free, but the membership is twenty nine dollars a month, and you just wave it at whatever you want, and and you're more mobile in that area. That's, I haven't tested it, but I've heard some pretty good results. I you know what? I, I don't even know if you're being serious or not, but I believe that that exists. <laughs> <Not either. laughs> oh man, there's a market for that though. There is. There is. <laughs> Dude, we we had to do a, a thought experiment in chiropractic school, and it was this guy was offering. He was a chiropractor. He was offering a service online, where you would send him money, and he would send good thoughts your way. And and he had <laughs> it was it was dead serious though. He had like a name for it, and there was actually a testimonial by a beagle on there. A dog. A dog. A beagle. Fucking it was, amazing. He, like not, not someone from the beagles. Like no, like a beagle wrote it and said, "Thanks for helping my hip arthritis. I'm walking that is around." Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, last little story and then we'll, and then I'll ask my last question. I was in, uh, Venice beach years ago, uh, walking, walking on the boardwalk and, um, I came across this guy on a bench. It said, sit down, leave all your problems here. So I sit down and you know, I, I, I don't know. I was just up, up for anything at that point. So I sat down next to the, uh, homeless guy, uh, you know, wanting to see what he had to offer. And he said, okay, write down all your problems on a piece of paper. So I wrote, I wrote down a couple of problems I had in my life. And he took it from me, he crumpled it, and he threw it away. And he smiled and said, well, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and how good did you feel after that? Amazing. Right? Amazing. Such a clever idea. And he didn't, he didn't ask me for any money. It was funny. Um, 
my last question is how how can God, how can people uh, find out more about you and how, how can gyms work with you? Number one, they can follow us on Instagram, Active Life Rx. Um, number two, we host workshops for coaches all the time. Come to one. Um, we just had a group of coaches this past weekend from really smart coaches from uh, CrossFit Buffalo and CrossFit Boomtown up in upstate New York there in Buffalo and, and Rochester. And they came down to us here in New York and they basically rented us out for the, uh, for the weekend. And we took Sweet. them through our baseline information and we're working on building more workshops off of that um, so that we can dive deeper into some of these topics that people really want to learn about. Um, and our website is performancecarerx.com. Um, that's where you'll find all the information about our programming. That's where you have the opportunity to purchase our programming should you want it. Um, and that's the best place to click and ask us a question. Awesome. Anything else you guys want to add? Uh, we hope that in the next 20 years, just like we make those other things absurd, that the term performance care is as ubiquitous in the CrossFit landscape as, or in the fitness landscape as mobility or flexibility is now. Because too often we're finding that people are coming to us with, if I could just be more mobile, I would feel better. And we're right. like, you don't need to be more mobile. You are mobile enough. You need to have strength to support your mobility. And the way that we achieve that is what we're calling performance care. So we're hoping that, you know, in 15 years, there's certainly a performance care segment in every CrossFit gym in the country, if not the world. I think that's a two-year goal, man. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. This was great. We'll talk Thank you, soon. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Later.